Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ, the living God. Welcome to Jesus God Incarnate Ministries, where I give you all things Jesus. So if you want some of this, like, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell so you know every time I release a video. Also, uh, comment any thoughts below, anything like that. I have an email in the about section. So if you want to, you know, email me, whatever it is there, you can go ahead. I also do this full time. So if you are blessed by this ministry, consider supporting me below by cash donations or buying any products that I made. Okay, going to the video. So this is, um, I think, one of those things that most Christians nowadays don't realize that there's an actual proper way to um, to read the Bible, and and uh, and 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 I'm and I'm going to go through a few different ways that I typically will read the Bible and its understanding when I do study it or, or you know, whatever have you. So there's a few different categories in terms of, and I wrote it down just so I don't miss anything, just so uh, you understand that there's more to the Bible than what you read, right? So first you have to understand that it is, if you are not reading it in Hebrew, in, in, in the Hebrew that it was written in, in, in I think it's Koine Greek, and then I think it's like classical Hebrew and Aramaic, you're not getting the full context linguistically. So, so the language, right, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek are much richer in, in terms of what I mean is they have layers to the... Uh, to to that language rather than more modern day stuff not saying that modern day languages are not like uh, complex and and layered up i'm just saying let's let's say for example you're reading the english version right the so english will doesn't have multiple words for like love for example right in greek there's four different ways for love right there's like the uh there's the godly love which is agape then there's like sexual love. I forgot what that one is. And there's like brotherly love. And then there's one more kind of love. It might just be three. I don't know. But just just giving you the idea, right? That there's multiple different ways or there's multiple different uh, categorically uh, ways to say love, right? For my for my language, for example, like an aunt and uncle on on each side, they have two different ways to say it. So in, in English, typically you just say, Oh, my uncle. Oh, that's my uncle. And then you just say on my mom's side. But in in English or in my language in what, right? That you 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 say on your uncle on your mom's side, you say one word, and then your uncle on your dad's side, you say another word. Your uh your aunt on your mom's side, you say another word, and then your aunt on your dad's side, you say another. so we literally got four different words for 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 pretty much the same thing, right? That we use one word for in English. So that's what I mean. So linguistically, this is this is this is where it catches up, and, and I think this is where a lot of people they <coughs> they might find it a drag, they might find it tedious, they might find it uh, just not necessary or something. But you cannot understand what the Bible is really saying until you go to the original language. At the least, this is this is at the least the common. Christian should know word study stuff. For example, I use the uh, the concordance, the Strong's concordance, like it's like an app, right? It's a Bible app. So you get the Bible app, and then you're able to basically go through a verse, but it has the original meaning language next, uh, uh, like let's say it's using worship, for example. It, it'll worship, but then in the app, you click the the parentheses of what that word means in the original language because if you look in a concordance which gives you the original meaning for each of the different words because there's multiple different ways like for english they use worship one way they worshiped him they worship this they worship this but in the original language there's actually different types of words they use that english didn't have like you know five or six different ways to say that so they just put worship and it's, it's it's not a bad thing it's just a limit it's just different in in uh in languages that's it right so that's where going back to the original language like for example when when the um when the disciples were in the storm and they're it's like oh we're gonna die oh my gosh uh, and then <coughs> 
and then um, Jesus calms the storm, right? I think he like speaks to the sea or something. And, and then he waves his hand at the, at the wind, something like that. Or the other way around that he speaks to the, to the wind and, or that he speaks to the waves of the sea. And then he waves his hand at the, at the wind. Either way, my point is when they saw that even the winds and stuff obey him, that the, the weather obeys him. The, it, it said that, that they were astonished and they fell at his feet or something along those lines and they worshipped him. Worship in that one is a completely different word for worship that that uh, is, is in another uh, part of the Bible where it says, and they worshipped the Lord their God or something, right? Because that worship is, is like a master. It's like a dog that hasn't seen its master for a long time. So it's like licking its, its hand and it's all over it, right? Like, oh, ah! you know, like, like. That like uh, uh you're gripping the leg of Jesus worship like ah oh, that ah oh, like that kind of worship not a oh or like you know prostrating or something like that because there's other forms that is worship but it's like a prostrating worship right versus like the 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 almost like soul gripping fear worship right so I say that to say that there are multiple different words in the Bible, that English is limited to using just this, right? Like a lot of people, they don't know that the original, that, that's why people, they, they use this verse as uh, a proof that Jesus is not God. When it says, no one knows the, the day nor the hour, uh, neither the son of man or neither the, the men on earth, men don't know the angels nor the son of man, only the father, but they don't know in the original language, knowing is not of knowledge. That word no is of declaration, right? The man is not going to declare the day. And not that he doesn't know it because, and this actually skips to, to, to another context, which is cultural. You have to know the culture of the Hebrews back then. It was culture that the father announces and declares the day of the, of the wedding day of, the, of his son, right? And the bride. Of course, if you're getting married and you don't know the day of your wedding, that'd be a problem, right? The, 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 probably the controller or whatever it is, right? That would just be a problem. If you don't know when you're going to get married, then you wouldn't know when to get prepared and all this other stuff, right? But what I'm saying is that culturally speaking, the father is the one that announces the day of, of the wedding. The son knows the day of the wedding. The bride knows the day of the wedding. But it's it's the father that announces it culturally in, in uh, Hebrew Hebrew culture, right? So, and then when you look at the linguistics, when you look at the original language, it's the exact same thing that is being reflected in culture, right? So, so for so for um, so for one to. Just look at that in the English, be like, oh, well, Jesus doesn't know everything, so he's not God. Well, have you looked at the original language? Have you looked at the context, right? Because that will give you a lot big, bigger uh, awareness of what's actually going on. Because, like, you, you and, and this, is, this is where, this is why I say that if you go through these contexts, right, you're going to essentially get to the point where... You have to conclude that Jesus is the Christ, he is God, and the Trinity is true, biblically speaking. There is no possible way. And now I'm just going to go through, through the list of what you actually need. So linguistic context, historical context, what was happening, what, when, when, when was it happening, who was, the, who was, the, seas, who was the, the ruler and all that stuff, where were they at uh, historically, what war just happened and all that stuff, right? Then there's scriptural context, which means... Like there could be something that Jesus is referring to or that the apostles are referring to in the New Testament points to a prophecy in the Old Testament that concludes whatever it is that they're trying to prove now. So you need to know scriptural context in, in, in terms of the, like sometimes Jesus, if you just like read what he says, it is verbatim line for line almost in the Old Testament, in Daniel, in Psalms, in this, in this, right? Like verbatim, it, but it's just him talking, right? So, <coughs> so, and, 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 and sometimes the, the scriptural stuff is, is a fulfillment of past events or future events or whatever it actually is. It ties together. That's a part of the context of what's going on. If you knew that Jesus uh, coming in, going, going ahead and t telling, telling the disciples, go get a donkey from here 
And then, and, and also get this, and also get this, and I'm going to ride on this donkey into the actual, uh, in, into the city. Did you know that in the Old Testament, that's how basically the, the king would come in, right? Like, like the, the new king would come in, right? So all these things you would have to learn, right? That, that, that Jesus tearing the, the, the veil being ripped, torn in two at his death was a, a, Old Testament prophecy, Old Testament things being fulfilled, right? So that's what I mean, scriptural context. Then there's contextual context, which means just literally in the text, what is what is immediately around it? And then, so, so like if you're reading, I don't know, John 14, verse 6, where I, I believe it's that one, where it says uh, that Jesus is the way, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to, to, uh, to the Father except through him, right? Being Jesus, except through me, being Jesus. So... In in the context, he's about to basically go die and all that other stuff, or or and, and you know you know go go and do complete his mission while he's on Earth. The immediate one was Thomas, or was it Thomas? It was Philip, I believe. Asked him, "Where are you going? Like, why? Why are you leaving us? Right? Like, what, what do you mean you're leaving us? Where are you going?" He's like, "Oh, I like I'm going to the Father." It's like, "Well, show us the Father." It's like, bro, I've been with you this long and you don't know. Well, we don't know the way. It's like, well, I am the way, the truth. You see what I'm saying? Like, so there's immediate context. There's the context right around it. There's the context of that chapter, right? And you just, you got to keep zooming out. There's the context of that book, right? Where there's be the book of John. And then there's the context of the New Testament. And then there's also the context of the entire Bible. How does that verse fit in the context of the entire Bible? Right. So there's those kind of contexts that you have to keep in mind because this will paint the picture more fully. Right. Then, like I was alluding to, well, like I said before, plainly is culture. There's a cultural context that have to go with it. Like it's culture for an old man not to run. Like just period. You're not supposed to be running as an old man. You have gained the respect that people will move out your way type stuff, you know? Oh, the old man wants them? Bro, just give it to him, you know? Like, obviously, not not in, like, evil and stuff, but, like, he's lived his life, and he has a, a head full of, of gray hair or white hair, and he's deserved the respect of everyone, right? Even fellow elders, especially the youth, you know? So, so, so he he's deserved that respect. You shouldn't be running. It's shameful, so when we read the prodigal son, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, the one that left, he said, dad, I wish you were dead. Basically, give me my estate now. He's like, okay, I got you. He leaves and he comes back. And then when he sees his son in the distance, he runs to him. He doesn't tell a servant to go after him. He doesn't tell a this to go after him. He goes after his son himself, running, not afraid to be shamed in front of everyone as an old man, as an old man, Right? So those are some of the cultural contexts that you have to understand that it, it is it is culture. It is the tradition, I guess, in, in the way that they did for women to for, for prostitutes and harlots to braid their hair in a, in a beautiful way and all that stuff and wear earrings and nose stuff and piercings and all that stuff to be to appear very beautiful. So and, 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 and whatever else in perfume and all that stuff. Right. So that so that. Um, so that one, they're they're beautiful and they're enticing physically, right? You can see them and be like, wow, like she's dead. okay, you know, like okay, right? So so that they entice you to come to them, right? So that's why I think it was a Peter, it might have been Peter or Paul. They they basically say that like it's shameful for women to wear braids. Like it's it's not saying like yo, don't wear braids, right? It's saying don't wear braids. To stand out like the prostitutes, because the prostitutes they make it really, really appealing to the eyes, and they make it really attractive, right? So it's saying like, just don't overdo it. Don't be like them. Don't be wearing all these hoops and all this, you know, the earrings and all that stuff, and then the makeup, and then not nah, 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 right. Like you don't have to do all that. You're a child of God. You know what I'm saying? So it's one of those things that you got to understand that context to know that that scripture isn't saying. Oh, if you if you culturally get braids like we us Africans, you know us East Africans, and a lot of other uh, uh, cultures around uh, around the world as well, they get braids because it's easier to manage our hair. Our hair gets really it's really curly, like C four C like four C or whatever it is. Um, 
the, like the, which is the curliest they can get. Ours is like C6, bro. Like this is really, really curly, you know? So, so, uh, uh, so, so that's what I mean by, by you have to know the cultural context. And then, and then there, there's another thing too. So exegete is when, if you exegete a, a, a text, it's basically when you let the text speak for itself and then it, it, whatever the text says, you take it for what it says, right? And then you, and then you look at the stuff around it in all the different contexts. I might've been leaving out a couple. If you go to like Bible school, you'll probably know way more, right? This is just a basic thing for any commoner to really like understand how the Bible could be read in a much, much better way in a much more understanding way, right? Exegesis where you let the speak, you let the text speak for itself. ICG is where you, where you basically speak something into the text, right? Where you're, where you have an idea and then you go to the text to try to confirm that idea. But then exegete is, is when you, when you let the idea come from the Bible itself. Like, so, so basically don't, if you speak something into it, it's, it's eisegeting. Like you're eisegeting a, 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 a verse or, or, or the Bible ideas. That's where heretics come in. Jehovah's witness, Mormons, uh, Hebrew Israelites, uh, uh, what, what else? Like a lot of uh, cults that come forth, like c c Roman Catholics, you have to eisegete a lot of different passages to come up with some weird stuff that's not even there. If you if you go properly go through all the stuff in Scripture and use the, just this basic framework of linguistic, you got to look at the original language at the least. At the least, a word study. Go go get you an app. It's online nowadays. You can just go go on the on 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 like websites like Bible dot, Bible uh, Biblehub dot com or something like that, right? <coughs> <coughs> Where you can essentially just look at the original language and it literally lays it out for you completely, and you can see what is being said and it gives you a verbatim translation, right? And then the historical stuff because history is important when you're looking at the Bible because it's a it's a historical reference. Like histor historians use the Bible as a history reference. That's saying something. If you don't understand, it's fine. Just know that the history in the Bible is valid, right? And that scripture, uh, scriptural context is something that you need to keep in mind too. What other parts of, of um, what are the parts of, of scripture can, can, can help clarify this? like scripture that you're reading. If you're reading something in Nehemiah, right? And something in Daniel and something in uh, 1 Corinthians or Revelation, all of this stuff, like it, it goes together. It supports it some way or another, right? And then contextual context, the, the, that verse, the paragraph around it, the, and then keep zooming out the, the chapter, keep zooming out that, like the book that you're reading or keep zooming out the, the new or the old Testament that you're in, keep zooming out to the entire Bible, the canon, of the Bible, right? And then there's the cultural stuff that you need to know as well. This is one way that you can slowly but surely start. And then also, I guess I would just add into there, listen to some sound sound doctrine uh, preachers, right? Vody Bauckham is a go-to for me. Uh, Jeff Durbin, uh, James White. I mean, they're, 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 everyone has their things that you might not agree with, but for the most part, those are very sound doctrine uh, people. There's Derek Prince. There's um, uh, Wally Works. He's he's pretty decent with this stuff too. There's uh, um, what's him call it? David Lynn. There's what are the preachers? Uh, there's a lot of preachers. I ain't gonna cap. There's a lot of preachers that I listen to. So the, 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 those are just the first ones that come to mind. But uh, a lot. There's a lot of good doctrine people, right? If you're, I would say, generally speaking. Most of the preachers, and I'm not saying all of them, I'm just saying most of the preachers on like worldwide television, like Daystar and, and, and TBN and all that stuff, like most of them, somewhere down the line, I would say a good 90% of them have some just uh, doctrine, like, like in terms of there's some serious issues with their doctrine is, is what I'm saying, right? And I'm not saying stop listening to them because that's what I, that's what I listened to for a long time. I listened to TBN like eight hours a day for a long time. Daystar, a long time, like two and a half years or something. And then it was, it was more like and then part time, like, like two more years, right? So like four-ish years I was on it, right? But I say that to say that God is, 
is good. And if you go about it in this way, plus with prayer and with fasting, when you feel led, that's the part where I always got to say, don't, don't fast just because you want to fast when you feel led and then fast and use that as a tool to help you. If you are praying for spiritual discernment, you know that in the Bible that it's okay to fast for God to hear your thing better, right? People initiated, kings and queens initiated a nationwide fast. Why can't you initiate a one-day fast, a two-day fast, a half-day fast, depending on your health, uh, if you're pregnant or not, if you're, if you are, um, like, depending on where you are uh, financially, depending on where you are mentally, how the work you have, like, be wise. Don't be, like, fasting in the middle of a hot summer and you're working construction and then you pass out, right? Like, yo, we got to be wise with this stuff. You can do a half day fast or something on your day off or a full day fast on your day off or whatever it is, right? Like you don't have to go all the way. Like, look, listen, in eternity, you're not going to be worried about the times that you were fasting. 50 million years from now, 100,000 billion years from now, you're not going to be worried about, oh, did I fast? No, you're going to be like, God is good. You know, like in heaven, you're going to be God is good, right? And even in hell, you're not going to be worried about all that stuff, right? You're going to be burning, I guess. I don't know, right? So it's, it's, it's one of those things you got to kind of, View it from an eternal realm, right? For, from an eternal lens, right? Like people like are so about, oh, we have to take care of our bodies. So you do, right? But if you're overdoing it in terms of now it's becoming an idol, that's where it's hard to, this is just a side tangent. It's hard to balance anything without it almost being a idol if you don't watch it, if you don't check it, right? So that's why we just lean into the Lord deny yourself and follow him. And uh, yeah, man. So I hope that this video will help you read the Bible in a little bit more uh, better context and you can understand it more. And this is how you can come to a sound doctrine, right? Sound doctrine, because the Bible is literally, it literally explains the Trinity. Like it's so obvious once you properly read the Bible, that's the part where people, but that's the thing people don't know about it, which is fine, which is fine. I'm here to bless people with what I know right? Like I'm not the end all be all. Listen again. I'm not the end all be all. Jesus Christ is the father and the Holy spirit. And if you have the Holy spirit, he shall remind you of all truth. Just know that this is one of the ways that God has revealed to sound minded Christians like myself and other people that have come up with sound conclusions of what scripture is saying. And then it is confirmed by what other scriptures say, the history, the language, the culture, the context, the exegeting and eisegeting, you know what I'm saying? So, so eisegeting is not good. You need to exegete a context or exegete the, the scripture because you're taking what scripture says and letting scripture explain what it says and then letting scripture mean what it like explain what it means rather than you come up with an idea and then put it in there. Right? So for example, Joseph Smith, last thing I'll say, Joseph Smith, Ellen G. White, uh, you know, all those people, they came up with a concept of this church is not the right church. Now I'm going to approach the Bible and, okay, they believe this, but that's not the right church. So I'm not going to believe that. Then they just kind of like put an idea of something. Then they put it into the thing. That's, ex that's eisegeting. That's not good, right? So if these videos bless you, like, subscribe. Share, hit the notification bell so you know every time I release the videos. Let me hear any thoughts below. Also, if you have uh, if you have a question or any comments or anything like that, I have an email in the about section. I also do this full time. So, if you want to support this ministry, if you're blessed in any way, you know, if you consider supporting, below some cash uh, donation places you can go to, and products you can buy that I have made. Peace. We'll catch you in the next one.